So you see some palm leaves uh, here, and uh, this is a reminder of us that this is the end of Holy Week. The end of uh, Sunday was last Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday. And uh, yes, I'm on. I'm on na now. <laughs> I'm on now. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And uh, last week, uh, we talked in Palm Sunday from John chapter 12 about uh, how Jesus uh, sent to his disciples, untie the donkey, right? And uh, that kind of paralleled our life last week when we talked about how um, untying a donkey so that the donkey and the foal or the, the, the colt, less than four years old, could come and be used by Jesus and he could ride that cult who had never been ridden before, down into the city of Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. And that began what we call Holy Week or Passion Week. And we talked last week about how untying the donkey is a great parallel to our lives. Not that we're all donkeys, but sometimes, I'm sure you'd agree, we all are. Amen. At some times in life. And how that parallel is that we need to be untied. We need to be released in order to have that journey with Jesus as his disciple. As we move from no birth to new birth, to milk, to meat, to maturity, that's a journey of a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And uh, we miss that journey and we get stuck along the way when we're tied up somewhere. And Jesus is always trying to release us from where we're tied up so that we can journey with him to where he wants us to be. And last week we talked about how everything changed. People knew that everything had changed uh, on what we call Palm Sunday. As the people laid down palms, and here was this not conquering king on a horse, but this was this king of peace. And he would proclaim peace for every person on the planet who would by grace receive his gift of salvation. Peace between that person and God and Peace between a family member and others, even though that very same gospel would divide families. It would divide people. It would divide cultures between those who want to believe and trust and follow Jesus as Savior and those who would not believe and receive but would reject that. And we have a world today who is in conflict. And the major conflict today is not about guns. It's really not about color. It's really not about cultures. It is about a world system that uh, does not want to see the gospel move forward and peace between God and mankind happen. It is about a not only a world system, but a flesh. We talked about this in the ministry center with our youth this morning in Sunday school or Bible study. It's about our flesh. When Jesus said, my will, not my will, but your will be done before he goes out of the Garden of Gethsemane and is betrayed by Judas and arrested and the trial starts and he's hung on that old rugged cross and he's beat beyond recognition and stripped, his flesh is stripped as they whipped him, as they mocked him and sold his clothes and bargained and played poker basically for his clothes, gambled them away, put the the crown of thorns on his head, mocked him with king of the Jews, that sign. And then he died saying, after the thief on the cross who had not been baptized, who had not walked down a church aisle, who, who didn't know anything about doctrine or theology, who repented of his sin, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now that'll shake up your theology just a little, won't it? Say by grace through our faith and that not of ourselves. It's not about what we can do or who we are. It's about who he is and what he's done already. Amen, church. Amen. And so we talked about how everything changed and people knew it. And that there was this new king who rode in on a donkey. And, um, and that's part of why Judas had betrayed him. Obviously, he was trying to press Jesus' agenda to... Uh, to go against Roman occupation and create chaos in the country and try to kick them out. And Jesus said, no, no, no. God's plan is so much bigger than that. God's plan is for a whole world, not just a people group. God's plan is for a whole world, not just a nation. 
God's plan is always bigger than what we think it is. Amen. Or what we pray about. And so there was this opportunity for everything to change. And, and it was about a new king we talked about. A new kind of peace. Uh, peace with God. Uh, not peace on a planet that will never happen. Uh, it's peace with God so that in eternity we're living with Him. And, and all of a sudden uh, everything changed and there was a new way to think and see and believe when that triumphal entry happened. As people laid the palm branches down as Jesus rode the donkey into the city of Jerusalem. Took off if they didn't have branches and and got there late. They were all Baptists. They got there late. And they didn't have palm branches stripped off of trees. Instead, they took their cloaks off and laid them right there. And, and all of a sudden, there was this new way to think and see and believe. And especially, there was a new way to follow. A new way to follow this king of peace. And we're going to follow up on that today. And uh, we're looking here, if you have your Bible, in 1 Corinthians in uh, chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. Three really simple principles today about what the resurrection really means. What does the resurrection really mean? Well, um, I can tell you that uh, this morning I had a real challenge. I, I, was, uh, I was thinking this morning and looking one last time at this passage and saying, God, is there anything that uh, you want to tell me that I need to know this morning before I have this dialogue with you between you, me, and, and folks who are in worship this morning because that's what preaching is. It's a dialogue that we're having with God this morning. This is not a teaching session where you're listening to me. This is a dialogue with God this morning. I said, God, in our dialogue with you in worship this morning, is there anything you want to tell me before I get up there? Because I know how you are. You don't tell me stuff, and then I get up there and you tell me stuff. And then I don't even remember what I said, right? That's the Holy Spirit in us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens in that dialogue when you help facilitate it or preach. And, and, uh, and, and, and I heard, uh, well, yeah, a part of what you're going to talk about is uh, that, that this is not something new. This was prophesied for Jesus to come die and resurrect again for people on the planet and, uh, and his grace be on display and challenge our faith to receive him uh, and, and follow in a whole new different way fellowship. And, and, and I'm like, okay, all right, yeah, what, what, whatever. What's that mean? And he reminded me of Genesis 3.15. This is crazy. You're not going to believe this. He reminded me of Genesis 3.15, right? Where it's the very first prophecy that Jesus, that God's providing himself, his son, to come as the Savior of the world. You remember what it is, Genesis 3.15? Anybody remember what that is? Yeah. Gonna, he, uh, the devil's going to bruise his head. Jesus, the crown of thorns. Going to bruise his head. But he, Jesus, is going to crush his heel. Right? And I'm like, okay, got it. I didn't think anything of it. And I don't, think I, I don't think God was happy with that because I, I got dressed and I don't like wearing this. Tom's wearing a suit. This is the best I can do. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, I, I, all I can think about this past week was it getting 40-something degrees so I can get my motorcycle out. That's all I could think about this past week. Not going to happen for a while, it looks like. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm getting dressed. I, I typically don't preach in this. If you know, it's in here. It's jeans and a shirt just like normal. And, and uh, this morning I thought... Uh, with a little help from my wife's encouragement uh, to dress up. And, um, and this is about it. And, and so I put these old shoes on that I've had forever. And uh, I'm just getting ready for church. And all of a sudden, I stand up, and guess what happens off of my left foot? Guess what happens? The heel falls off. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's crazy. The heel fell off. Yeah, you, look. See if I can do this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank, thanks, Annette. You probably got that right in there. Nick probably zoomed up on it, didn't he? The heel fell off. I'm like, uh, wow, Lord, that's a little crazy. So that must be really important. Thank you for reminding me of that. Now I go on about my business, and I get in the car to come to church this morning, Cody, and guess what happens? 
my other heel fall down. <laughs> Not kidding. I thought about just not wearing shoes at all, but I was afraid my feet would fall off, right? <laughs> Both heels of my shoes fell off this morning. So I think God may want us to be reminded this morning that from the very beginning, God had resurrection in mind. He had resurrection in mind. I don't know what I'm going to do with these, but I'm sure not putting them on the shoes. <laughs> I'm not sure. He had, in Genesis 3, 15, where at the fall of mankind, God reminded the reader for all these centuries and in the future us, for all those to come beyond us, God has reminded us that from the foundation of the world, God had a plan he had one for you, he had one for me, and he had one for the world, all of us, John 3, 16. And it involved Jesus, uh, who was set apart from Muhammad and uh, Buddha, and you could just go down the list of people who claimed to be God in the flesh, who claimed to be a Savior, who claimed to have wisdom from God, who claimed to be it, the one, but they all died. None of them rose from the grave. They all died. Their teachings still exist. And there are people who follow a dead, non-risen Savior that is not real. And from the very beginning in Genesis 3.15, God made it clear there's only one. Only one God. Only one Creator. Only one God. Lots of power and principalities. But only one God. One world, one world system, one flesh. And Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. And every day we battle that, not mine, but your will be done. And some days it's not yours, my will be done. Amen. Can we confess that this morning? Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and all of a sudden, Jesus in, in the, what we have in our New Testament, here's the Apostle Paul comes on the scene who was a pretty bad boy in his day. He was a religious zealot. He was one of those that believed in a real God but didn't get a real Savior. He was about to miss it like an Orthodox Jew in that day missed it and still miss it today or like a lost Gentile today refutes it, doesn't believe it. And by the way, it's easier to believe that there is one rather than not one. The evidence all points to there is one, right? Not, not one, no evidence about not one. Paul said it this way. You look at creation, you know there's got to be a creator. A creator. So, so Paul, who, who was knocked off his donkey, Jesus rode a donkey in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Later, Paul, the religious zealot responsible for killing no telling how many Christians in his day because of his religious views and beliefs, no telling how many he killed or was responsible for dying, gets knocked off his donkey, talks to Jesus, gets up a what we would call a saved or a believer, one who trusts in the Lord, right? And, and does great things for God. And here's what he says in our text this morning. As we think about the resurrection and the empty tomb. Here's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's already talked about the gospel that he preached to the people at Corinth who were a mess. And he says in verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve, after, and, and, and then, um, I'll just stop right there, verses 3 through 5, right? Let's pray together. Lord, 
Uh, we are in this dialogue with you this morning. And so, Holy Spirit, we trust you to be our teacher. Thank you that you always are. And this morning on Resurrection Sunday, teach us and customize what you want every person in this room to know and how to apply that to their life. And what a difference you, who you are, what a difference you are, what a difference you want to be. You are the difference maker. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher in this place this morning. Teach us God's word. Give us understanding. Give us awareness. Help us to believe and trust in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. So real, real simple this morning. Three, three quick things. So number one, what, what does it mean, the resurrection? What does it, an empty tomb really represent? First of all, it represents that we are debt free. Debt free. It has taken Lisa and I a long time to move toward becoming debt free. We, we still have a few, few things on the docket. Um, and debt free in, uh, in the Bible uh, is, is, is not necessarily a principle, but moving toward minimizing your debt so that you're not a slave to it. Is very important in Scripture. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and we never want to be a slave to our debt. And, the, and we're talking about finances here in Scripture. But there is a different kind of debt that the Bible talks about that is the most important kind of debt to be debt free from. And, and uh, listen, listen to what he says here. He says, uh, by, the, by the way, what Paul says in in uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verses 3 through 5, that is the gospel. It is the heart of the gospel. And that's why Paul is sharing it right here to these Corinthians. And so when he says, for I delivered to you, first of all, when I delivered to you, he's talking about how there is this process when we deliver. When he's delivering the heart of the gospel that he's about to deliver that Christ died and rose. When he's about to deliver the heart of that, he's saying there is a giver and a receiver. And I have received. I have heard from a giver and I have received. And now I am going to give. I'm, I'm going to, to share it with you. So to deliver, there's a cycle around that word here in the Greek uh, that I have delivered to you, right? Um, he's not just saying, I am sending information your way for you to hear that creates awareness for you. It's not just that. Please don't miss this. This is really important. When Jesus later gives a great commission and says, go make disciples. It's really important. Because the heart of the gospel is not hearing only. The heart of the gospel is two-part coin, right? Spiritual coin. It is hearing and sharing. Hearing and sharing. The gospel is not just about hearing. It is about sharing. And Paul uses this word to communicate an important truth for the Corinthians who were struggling in a world system, who were struggling in their flesh, with uh, my will but not yours, God, was struggling with judgment against each other, was struggling to the left of milk. They, they were, they'd experienced new birth um, uh, from, from no birth, but they weren't even to milk yet. And they were eating each other up alive. They couldn't even meet for spiritual times of worship uh, and the Lord's Supper to remember Him without abusing those environments. They were like a body who was going into an epileptic fit and no parts of their body were working together as God had intended for the body of Christ to do. And Paul says something very, very important. Uh, when he Go ahead to that next one, Jared. When he talks about being debt-free. Part of debt-free is not that you hear, but you share. Because you hear that what Paul says here and, and what he says that the heart of the gospel I delivered to you first of all means of first importance. He's saying out of everything I've ever said to you, ever taught you, 
ever, you ever learned from what God has taught me, there's one thing that is most important. That's what he's saying here when he uses that terminology. So I have delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. I heard it from the Lord. He knocked me off my donkey. Acts 22, that's what he's referring to in his testimony, recorded by uh, Dr. Luke in pretty good detail in the record of the church in the book of Acts in chapter, our chapter 22 in our Bible. And, and he's referring to the fact that, hey, I received it. I received it from the Lord. I, he, he talked to me. I received it and now I'm delivering it. I'm, I'm sharing it, right? I'm sharing it with you. And it is the most important thing I could possibly share with you. Out of all the conversations that we have with all the people we know and don't know, there is one conversation that is of the most importance. And for some of us in our families, it is the most difficult conversation to have. Amen? Most difficult with people that we know, that we've been around. And part of it is because they know us and they know our faults. And they know where we've blown it and when we're still blowing it. And they don't understand grace is not about what we do or what we don't do. It is a gift from God and that we're never going to be sinless, but we will learn how to sin less in a transformational process when we receive Jesus Christ because we've heard the gospel. And yes, anybody ever calls you as a Christian a hypocrite, just go, yes, I am. Yes, I am. That'll throw them for a loop. Oh, oh, oh. You are? Yeah, I am. Every person on the planet a hypocrite. Every person. And I'm working on it. What about you? How would you like to have all that hypocritical stuff forgiven? Because until that happens, you aren't debt free. You have to pay your own sin debt. Romans 6.23, right? For we've all sinned, right? We've all sinned. And the wages of sin are death. Eternal death. Eternal death. There will be a day, my friend, if you're here. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to love you. Amen? That's a different. That's different. I'm not trying to scare you. I came out of an alcoholic biker life. I can tell you right now, nobody could scare me. I wasn't afraid of anything except my wife. I was afraid of her. But that's it. I wasn't afraid of anything. And when, when I heard the gospel the, for the first time, going to church for the first time at age 23, it wasn't about someone trying to scare me into heaven. It was somebody telling me how much God loved me. And, and He loved me so much He died for me. That's what got me. That's what, that's what helped me. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on you this morning if you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. I'm loving you this morning. Amen? Amen? Because the most important conversation I can have with you this morning, because you're a captive audience, it's Easter. Amen? Amen. It's Easter. I probably won't see you till Christmas. <laughs> and, now, and now that I said that, you won't even come at Christmas. <laughs> you might not come at Easter again. I don't know. I'm just telling you, the most important conversation we could have today is what Paul's having with these Corinthians at the Corinthian church. Many of these people, I'm convinced, went to church and became part of a loving, caring community even amidst their hypocrisy and their mess. There was still enough of that to attract them there. But they really didn't know Jesus. And Paul wanted to make sure. And he said... I delivered to you, first of all, the most important conversation, the most, the priority thing that I could ever talk to you about so that you could be aware and discover your need for Jesus that I also received, I received it, and now I'm sharing it that Christ died for your sins according to the scripture and God said this morning Jim that's Genesis 3:15 I went yeah and he knocked my heel off 
And I went, wow, that's a little weird. Genesis 3.15. I remember that about the heel, the head and the heel. And then I got in the car and he knocked my other heel off. <laughs> and I said, okay, God, I'm collecting heels. I've got two of them so far. I'm putting them in my pocket. All right. By the way, thank you. You did what I asked you to do. I said, God, if there's anything you want me to bring out this morning before I get up there and then you just all of a sudden tell me, tell me what it is. And he did. Amen. He did. Right? So, so debt free means that I don't have to pay. The wages of sin is debt. I don't have to pay that wage for my life. I can be debt free. Are you debt free this morning? Amen. And here's how you get debt free. He shares the heart of the gospel right here. Christ died for our sins. According to you, or according to the scripture, all through from Genesis 3.15 through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, uh, this was prophesied over and over and over. There would be a Savior. God would make a way when there is no way. There would be a Savior who would come. And uh, it wouldn't be a prophet. It wouldn't be a king. It wouldn't be a priest. It would be a Savior. A Messiah. And He would take away the sin of the world. And, and, and it's interesting here. It, it just came back to me. That when He says, uh, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins... It just came to me, the word sins here in the Bible language means to drown. Look it up. It means to drown. If you got logos or something like that. So the, the picture is that we are drowning in our sin. We are in, we are in the sea of sinfulness. That's the picture here. We are in a life full of sin and sinfulness. And there is no way to escape it. And someday if we stay and drown in our sin, we will not experience God's best in heaven or for eternity. For all eternity we will go and we will continue to drown in the consequences of that sin. I never understood it that way for years, even after I was in ministry. And and I see that picture so clearly now. And so Paul was simply saying that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is a hand into the sea of your sinfulness. And he reaches down and, he, and, and, and his grace and you receiving his grace says, I will take your hand. And he pulls you out of the sea of sinfulness and he sets you upon a rock. And he says to you, today or someday you will be with me in paradise because you've now repented of your sin. You've invited me to be your savior and the boss of your life. And I know you're not going to be perfect, but we'll work on that. I know you're not going to be sinless, but we'll work on that. I know that you're going to blow it, but we'll work on that. I know, and you just keep going down the list, you little hypocrite, right? Or big hypocrite in my case. And we'll work on that. It's a journey. Or I can say, no, I don't want your help. I don't want your help. No hand for me. I'm fine right down here in the sea of sinfulness. I'm fine with dying in this world and going to the next and experiencing the consequences of living in the sea of sinfulness myself. That's my sea. You're your own sea. And I'm okay with that. Right? And Jesus says you can be debt free. I've paid the price. I've risen from the grave. I've conquered death and hell. I took the sting out of death. And you, you can be debt free. And then look at the next verse. There's a second one. Not only debt free, but he says here that, that we can be set free. Set free. Um, he says here, real quickly here in verse, uh, in chapter 15, verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So he's saying here buried, um, uh, buried is this, this concept of, 
of, of dying, um, but being resurrected is this concept of supernatural resurrection back to life, right? That's what it is. And you can, you can never die to yourself. And be resurrected without the grace of God and receiving that grace by your own faith. That's the process. Well, it can't be that simple, Pastor. There's got to be something else I've got to do. No, there's, that's the point, my friend. There's nothing you can do. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Amen. It's done. It's complete. There's nothing you can do. If it was about you doing, it would be works. It wouldn't be grace. If it was somebody else besides God in the flesh dying as His Son Jesus, God had to initiate that payment. There's no other payment that can prepare you and take you out of the sea of sinfulness and make a payment for it so that you can be debt free. But God did that. So now you can be set free. You can be set free from the power of the world system. You can be set free from yourself and your carnalness of always doing what feels good or what you want to do. You can struggle now with, listen, struggling with not my will, but yours is a good thing because until you're struggling with not my will, yours, uh, you're just saying my will. <laughs> you're just doing your own thing. You're just doing what you want. And, and, and even though we still struggle in the flesh, you're set free from that. You have opportunity to break free of that. And follow Jesus. And so we're not just debt free because of the resurrection as an opportunity, but we are set free. We don't have to follow the world's ways. I don't have to continue to be an alcoholic. I don't have to continue to use drugs. I don't have to continue to be immoral. I don't have to have that consistency of, of you name it that has enslaved you. I am no slave to anything anymore because of the resurrection of the Lord, His grace, my receiving that grace, grabbing His hand, Him pulling me out of the sea of sinfulness, and me saying, I'm so grateful, I will follow you with your help. It's not a life of perfection, but it's also not a life to sin. It's not a life to sin. We can be set free, and we can be set free from powers and principalities, not just the world and the flesh, but the devil. Uh, he's already, he, he may have bruised the head of Jesus on the cross, but, but resurrection broke his heel. It broke the power of the devil over those of us who know Jesus as Savior. That doesn't mean he doesn't attack. That doesn't mean that we don't have practice spiritual warfare. We'll be looking at that in our Ephesians study over the next weeks on Sunday morning. But it does mean that we are set free from the world, the flesh, and the devil for an eternity of bliss and joy with the Lord that starts now on this planet every day we live and follow. Amen. And then, here's the last one. Now we can live free. <laughs> That's the good part. I, I, I'm going to be honest. I've had a lot of baggage all my life from my dysfunctional family, from my upbringing, from trauma. Um, that's part of what pushed me into the kind of life I was in when I received Christ at age 23. Never been to church, never really heard the gospel, but I had a wife who, who went back to church, recommitted her life to God because she followed Him and made that decision when she was a kid. And uh, she was trained up through the church and she did not depart. She went back. And I thought it was her, right? I didn't know it was me. I tried to get rid of her. And thank God that didn't work. <laughs> thank God it didn't work. Now, she, hopefully, you, you thank God too, right, baby? It didn't work. Yeah, okay. <laughs> June will be 45 years. It'll be 45 years in June. And uh, we've loved each other a long time before that. We were high school sweethearts. You're supposed to go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That was for her. <laughs> um, but I, I'm just telling you, I, I became a Christian for the first half of 40 years of serving the Lord now. I didn't realize I could live free. I didn't, I didn't realize I could live free. I, I didn't know that I could put my past me behind me. Because Jesus already did. I didn't know that in the present me, 
I, I could serve in a way that lived free. I didn't realize for years as a Christian, and some of you may be there right now. We're, we're just about done. Hang on with me. Some of you today may be right there. Maybe you don't understand because you're debt free. Jesus is your Savior and Lord. And, and you have been set free. You can live free. You can live free of all the attachments that have been attached to you. You can live free because you've already broken free from your dysfunctionality, from your addictive past that keeps haunting you. Those horrible mistakes and the consequences that you're still reeling from, feeling. You can live free. You can live free. You, you can live free from... From a world system that entangles you, you can learn if you will. The, the answer to unity with God is always maturity. Unity requires maturity. If you want to have the kind of relationship with God that you dream about, oneness, if you want to love people like the Lord tells you to, the key to that unity is maturity. You need to work on spiritual maturity. Maybe you're at milk this morning. You need to start moving to meat. We'll help you. There are a lot of people who will help you pray. Let God map a plan for you for, to, to, for transformation and spiritual maturity. You can live free. You can live free, not from the attacks of power and principalities that happen every day, but you can live free from the consequences of those attacks. You don't have to you don't have to give in to those attacks on a consistent basis. You've broken free. You can live free. And if you need um, some in confidence to meet with one of our pastors about living free, we'd love to do that. We'd love to follow up with you about what it looks like to live free. It took me 20 years as a Christian in ministry, by the way, to really learn what it looks like to live free. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Well, let's start with debt free. Do you want to be debt free? You're, I am pastor. I'm, I'm a believer in Jesus. I've committed my life to follow him. I struggle. Uh, but I'm, I, I am convinced. I'm, I have great confidence that, that uh, he is my savior. I've committed my life to him. I'm following him. And he's helping. Awesome. Well, pastor, I, I'm not debt free. I'm I believe in God, but I've never really committed my life to follow Jesus and ask Him. I've never really invited Him to be my Savior. I've never really said to Him, Jesus, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry for my sin. Um, I repent. I change direction from my sinfulness toward living for You. I'm going to make intentional, purposeful effort to that. And God, would You help me? Come into my life. Take control. I've not done that. Well, the biggest ploy of the devil, power and principalities in your life, is to convince you that just believing in God is enough. No, you have to commit your life to Him. If you would like to do that this morning, I'd love to pray with you. Anybody this morning, Pastor, I want to commit my life to follow Jesus. I want to be a Christian. I, I want to, I want to uh, invite Him this morning to be my personal Savior and the Lord of my life. Anybody this morning, just lift your hand. I want to pray with you where you're seated this morning. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Been waiting for that. Yes, brother. I've been waiting for that. Yes. Anybody else? Anybody else this morning? I want to pray and receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Anybody else this morning? All right. There are several. Um, Lord, you, you pray with me right now. In fact, um, well, let, let's pray right now. Lord, you, you pray. There's no magic in the prayer. This has to be from your heart. The Bible says in Romans that we confess Him. We believe in our heart. We confess Him with our mouth that He is Lord, right? That's the concept here. So you pray right now where you're seated. Dear God, go ahead and tell Him. Dear God, thank You for loving me. Go ahead and tell Him that. Thank You for loving me. Jesus... Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Just tell him that. Something you must mean as you talk to him. Thank you for dying for my sin. Forgive me of all my sin, past, 
present, and future. Say that to him this morning. Forgive me of all my sin, past, present, and future. I repent of my sin. I, I turn direction away from you, and now, God, I head towards you. Just tell him that. I repent of my sin. I turn direction from heading away from you to heading towards you now. Now I invite him. I invite you to come into my life and be my Savior. Thank you for your grace. Thank him for grace that you don't deserve. Now thank you for mercy. Thank him for mercy. Mercy, not giving you what you do deserve. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace and mercy. I receive you now as my Savior. Tell him that. I receive you now as my Savior. I make you the boss of my life. Help me in my struggles. I now follow you. Tell him that. I now follow you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And, and all the angels in heaven have rejoiced, and so do we this morning for you. Amen. Amen. If you need to be set free, if you need to learn to live free, get in touch with us. Uh, we would love to talk to you and walk you through whatever you need. That's the kind of church we are becoming as we engage our community, as we care for folks, etc. Good Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Bill's going to come up here and uh, say a few words, close us out, pray for our meal downstairs. I know some of you have meals at home. I know that you got to run to those. If you're a guest today, uh, please consider staying with us. We've got lots of food downstairs. And if you're a guest and you ever come back and bring food, um, God said something about bring cherry pie. I don't know. <laughs> this happens to be my favorite. The... Bill. Good morning, church. It's a blessing to see all your faces here. Hey, listen, um, if this is your first time here, or you're not a regular attender, please, what you see here, what you hear here, that's the Holy Spirit's love at work for us right now. You, you, you can come here any other week, and you're going to hear the same type of love and message that's here. And I encourage you to come back, not to fill these seats. <laughs> it's beautiful to see, but I encourage you to come back and, and experience that love throughout the rest of the year. We, are on, we, we do have an excellent uh, uh, Ephesians uh, study that we're working on. So um, if you would, please bow your heads. We're going to go ahead and uh, bless the food or ask for the food. So, Heavenly Gracious Father, once again, we thank you and praise you so much for the breath of life. We thank you for your, your, your beautiful mercies that are bestowed upon us. And as we celebrate today the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, the dying on the cross for us, for our sins, Lord. We just thank you, we honor you, and we praise you. We ask a blessing on the food, the hands that prepared it, and it's a Christ-handed prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.